Well, good morning, Macedonia Church family and all of you out there who will be watching this video at a, at a later time. It is good to see all of you here on this Resurrection Sunday morning. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer to begin our service today. Father, Lord, you know we thank you. We love you and we praise you for all that you do in our lives. And Father, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you would take this day Father, that you would be honored, that you would be glorified. Father, I pray that in everything that is said and done today, through your word, Lord, and through song, Lord, that you would be honored and lifted up. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. To begin our service today, uh, we want to introduce the Garrison family. It's 
Thank you, Garrison family and family friends. If you will, open your copy of God's Word to Luke chapter number 24. I told the guys here as we were recording this morning that if we were over in the meeting house, as you see in the background there, uh, this would be one of those mornings when I would walk up in the AV room and I'd look at Dennis and Bill and Jeff or David or whoever may be up there that Sunday morning and say, okay, boys, y'all just need to grab a place and hang on because I'm just not 100% sure exactly what direction the Lord's got us going. I, I know where we're at in the scripture, but I'm just not sure exactly how the Lord's going to going to complete this entire message. So if you will, I've already told David that uh, he won't have to put any scripture up this morning because I'm going to be back and forth a good bit. So I'm going to ask you, get out your copy of God's Word and follow along with me as we listen to what the Word of God has to say to us this morning. Uh, this morning as we look, we're going to be in Luke chapter number 24. In Luke chapter number 24, we, we get a picture of the of the resurrection morning of Jesus rising from the dead, the things that happened. And I just want to kind of want to tell you that until we get to the main place that we want that we want to talk about this morning. You see, on that morning after Jesus Christ had had given his life for our sin on that Friday, and after Jesus had been buried in the grave, and on this third morning after Jesus had risen from the dead, the Bible tells us that several women who had on that Friday night who had prepared and gotten together all the spices and the incense, all the things that were used to, to embalm the body in that day and time, uh, it got too late. They were unable to go to the tomb because it had, the Sabbath had begun. And on this morning, they got up very early in the morning. They went out to the tomb and the Bible tells us that as they were walking toward the tomb, they had conversation among themselves and said, well, my goodness, who is going to move the rock for us? And it wasn't but just a few seconds later that a mighty earthquake, they felt a mighty earthquake happen and they continued on still wondering what in the world is going on. And they wandered on and made their way toward the tomb. And as they got there, they saw the soldiers, the soldiers had passed out. And they looked and the rock that had covered the tomb had been moved. Their prayers had been answered and they looked inside and the Bible tells us that they saw the grave clothes, but there was no body. And then the Bible tells us here in Luke's account on Luke chapter number 24 that two angels appeared to them and said, Women, why are you here looking among the dead for the living? For Jesus has risen from the dead. He is alive. Don't you remember that He told you these things were going to happen? And my friends, I want to share with you that remembering is a key point for this morning. Jesus talks a couple of times and He mentions a couple of times and we're going to look in God's Word where it says that we're to remember. We're to remember. He's, they, then they remembered after the angels talked to them, after they saw, after they witnessed all that they had seen and heard, they remembered what Jesus had said. And they left that tomb. They rushed back. They went and told the 11 the disciples there and the other folks that were gathered with them still there in the upper room. They said, listen, Jesus' body is gone. And two angels appeared to us. And they, they said, Jesus, is, He's not here. He's alive. And the, the Bible tells us here in this account in Luke chapter number 24 that the people there said, well, that's just nonsense. They didn't believe them. They had doubts. They didn't trust what was being said. But apparently the apostle Peter was touched by their words. And maybe Peter for just a moment remembered what Jesus had said because the Bible tells us that he jumped up and ran out. And then when we go to John's account, it says that John jumped up, the apostle John jumped up and he ran out behind Peter and actually caught Peter, passed Peter, got to the tomb ahead of Peter, but stopped short of going in, just peered in. But Peter ran past him, ran in, and Peter saw the grave clothes laying there empty with no body. And Peter also saw the, the handkerchief that had covered Jesus' face, which was a custom in that day, and it had been folded and laid to the side. Now that's a message for another day. But then we have the accounts where Jesus, he met Mary Magdalene and he spoke with her. And then we come to the account that I want to emphasize this morning. 
And that is the account that is found where Jesus took a walk. On the same day after he had risen from the dead, he took a walk on a road that led from Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. It's a walk that was about a seven mile walk and Jesus met two men. Why is that important? That's what I want us to look at this morning. And the Word of God says, That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked alone, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus Himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing Him. And Jesus, unrecognized by these two men, He said, now what are you discussing so intently as you walk along here? And they stopped short. But friend, I want you to notice the countenance that is so prevalently shown to us here. It says not only did they stop short in disbelief that this person couldn't un didn't know all the things that had happened. Look at what it says. It said sadness written across their faces. You see, they had been with the ones in the upper room when the women came back and reported what they had seen and heard that Jesus had risen, but yet we see them with sadness on their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, he replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. And Jesus Boy, he opens up a dialect here, doesn't he? He looks at them and remember, they don't know who he is. He is a stranger, a person that is joining them. And Jesus asks, what things? Oh, my friends, Jesus opened an opportunity that these men's attitude would reveal something in their hearts that we have to be mindful of ourselves. Who do you say I am? You see, Jesus had asked that question of His disciples many weeks before this event came about. And Jesus opened the opportunity and listened to what these men said. The things that happened to Jesus. But look how they describe Jesus. You know, the man from Nazareth. You know, the, the one who, who, is, who, who was the prophet who, who did those powerful miracles. And, and He was a a mighty teacher. Did you notice? Did you notice a man from Nazareth? A man who was a, a, just a prophet who did miracles. And, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. In verse 20 it says, But our leading priests and other religious leaders, they handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. Look at verse 21. Look at their attitude. Look at what how they had lost hope. They said, we had hoped He was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. And then they said, this all happened three days ago. And then they went on with the story. They said, some of the women from our group of followers, they, they had gone to the tomb early this morning and, and they came back to us and they gave us this amazing report. They said that Jesus' body was missing and that they told us that they had seen a couple of angels and these angels had said that Jesus is alive. So some of our men, they, they ran down to the tomb and sure enough, there, when they got there, they found that it was just like the women said, uh, Jesus' body wasn't there, it was gone. But did you notice they didn't talk about the angels? other than what the women had reported. Their countenance, their attitude. And look, at, we, we get an understanding of that because we look at how Jesus responded to them in chapter number 25. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people. Now let me share with you that Jesus was not calling them fools. He said, those of you who have lost your discernment, you have not held on to the comprehension of understanding the divine things that I had already shown you and told you about. You're lacking the intelligence to, to hold on to the things that I had shared with you. 
you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly predicted that these things must happen to the Messiah, that he would have to suffer, and he would have to go through all these things before he entered his glory? Then Jesus took them. Listen, my friends, this is where we're going this morning. Jesus took them through the writings of Moses. Jesus says, we got to go back to the writings of Moses. We got to understand why I came. We cannot try to just jump off and tell people, well, you just need Jesus. You got to be saved. We got to know and be able to share with them why. We've got to be able to tell them our story. Why? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And by this time, it says that they were nearing uh, the end of their walk to Emmaus and it was getting late in the afternoon and Jesus, still unknown to them, said, well, I'm going to go on. But they persuaded him and said, well, listen, just come and stay the night with us since it's getting so late. So Jesus went and with them to their home. They sat down, they fixed a meal and they said, as Jesus broke the bread and gave thanks for it, that their minds were opened. They suddenly recognized that this was Jesus. And it says that at that moment, Jesus disappeared from them. And they looked at each other. And they said, didn't we realize, didn't we recognize, didn't our hearts burn within us? Where was that all striking presence of Jesus that had been with us the whole time we had walked with him didn't our hearts burn with us as we talked as he talked with us on the road and as he explained the scriptures to us and within that very same hour though it was late in the evening they were right back on the road headed to Jerusalem seven miles away walking they found the other 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to, G to Peter. Listen, my friends, but Peter wasn't there. We can look in the accounts and we see that Peter had gone home. It says down there in verse number 12 that after Peter had seen that Jesus' body was gone, he was gone home. But he had apparently had sent word that he had seen what had been said. Listen, then these two men, they begin to share their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they had recognized him after he had bro broken the bread and given it to them. And just as they were telling their story of all that they had experienced with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, the Word of God tells us right here that Jesus himself suddenly was standing there with them. And Jesus spoke these words, Peace be with you. But the whole group, they were startled and frightened. Listen, Jesus knew their hearts. Listen to what they were saying, thinking. Thinking they were seeing a ghost. And Jesus speaks to them in verse number 38. He says, Why are you so frightened? Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Remember, Jesus knows the heart. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You see that it's really me. Come on, touch me. Make sure that I'm not a ghost. Because ghosts don't have bodies. You know, I think Jesus would say, well, you're not supposed to believe in ghosts anyway. But you know that a ghost doesn't have a body. As you can see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands. He showed them his feet. And still they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you... Do you have anything to eat? Jesus wanting so to, for them to see and understand who He is and to believe that He had truly risen from the dead just as He said He would. And my friends, today, today, we need to grasp a hold of the fact of what it means that Jesus is our risen Savior. They gave Him a piece of broiled fish and He ate it as they watched. Then Jesus said... When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms 
must be fulfilled, then it says that Jesus opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. My friends, let me share with you that we don't have to wait as born-again children of God. For my friends, when we came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, when we came to know and believe and trust in the resurrection of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, He opened our minds. He opened our hearts. He opened our ability to understand fully the Scripture and to believe and to know and to have the ability to do exactly what Jesus is sharing with us right here. The ability to go back and to show others that they are sinners, to show others how sin came into the world, to show others their need for Jesus Christ, to show others the, how the Ten Commandments reveal to us that we are sinners in need of a Savior. Jesus says, go back to Moses, go back to the prophets, go back to the Psalms and reveal to the world that they are sinners. They need Jesus. My friends, listen. Jesus says, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in the authority of His name to all the nations. Beginning in Jerusalem, there is forgiveness of sins for all who repent. You are my witnesses. And my friends, Jesus is still saying that today. Church, we are the witnesses of the truth of the gospel message. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, Jesus said. Now we know that there is an expanse of time here. We know that Jesus walked on this earth for 40 days after he rose from the dead. We know that just before, about 10 days before the Holy Spirit would come, that Jesus Christ ascended back to His glory in heaven and He told His disciples, you stay here for another 10 days and you wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, and now I will send that Holy Spirit just like the Father had me to promise. Remember Jesus in John chapter number 14 and in John chapter number 16, He had given them the promise that when He returned to heaven that He would send the Holy Spirit. And because He sent the Holy Spirit, He said, you will do even greater things than the things that I have done. I will send the Holy Spirit just as my Father promised, but stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with power. My friends, my friends, why is the gospel message so important? Why do we celebrate this day on which we remember the resurrection of our Lord and Savior? For the child of God, we know that we, re we celebrate this day because it is that day that reminds us of our salvation. But for the world that is living in some of the greatest fear that it has known in the last 80 years, this day, this season, it's no different than any other time of the year. Especially when this morning I looked right before we came to film this message that 1.6 million people have been confirmed infected, not counting the ones that have not been confirmed. And right now we're, we're bumping 100,000 people worldwide who have died from this errant virus that came out of nature and is attacking humanity with thus far no immunity and with thus far no vaccine in sight. Not only is the world in a panic over the disease itself, the world is in a panic over how, how are we going to recover from the devastation that this disease is bringing into our economic stability. All these nations are struggling. They're, these are desperate times and people tend to react wrongly. People tend to react without any hope in desperate times. Right now, people are placing their hope in their respective governments to keep their nations afloat until this too passes. People are already saying, where's my check? People are already saying, I thought there was not going to be a waiting period before unemployment began. People are, all, are already saying, is this going to be enough to sustain us through? And then people are saying, well, when is the until? When is it going to end? When will we go back? To, to working our jobs and living life like we're accustomed to doing. People, and people are saying, when are, when are we going to have enough? And when are we just going to say, we just got to go back to work? 
we've got to just let what happens happens and listen there are many many hopeless cries that are going on and on in the world today and Jesus told us it's going to be that way it's going to be that way in the time nearing my return just before he went to the cross Jesus taught us these very things and the fact is this God's word has led your pastor and many other pastors around this world today to say for years that when calamity, when chaos, when fear, when hopelessness, when desperation comes into people's lives in this world, many of them will find themselves turning to and trying to understand God. And my friends, in the world today, the nearest thing that people find in relation to God is the church. So church, you see, this past week, celebration is, is not, um, it's not about celebrating this past week, what we call Passion Week. It's not about celebrating this weekend that we call the weekend of Easter or Resurrection Day. And it's certainly not about us. You see, my friends, it's about Jesus and His gospel message being seen. It's about Jesus and His gospel message being heard. It's about Jesus and His gospel message being, writ being witnessed through the, His church every day, not just this day. For you see, my brothers and sisters, Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior, He is alive every day. He is desiring to work through His church every day, not just hear them celebrate on this day. And many people in the world are asking, Church, why is Jesus' resurrection so important to me? The world around you may be asking this question, what, what good is that to me? What good is His resurrection in my present situation? Friends, you see the issue... Let me say that again. Friends, don't you see the issue in the world today? The issue is not the present problems in the world. The issue is the present world and those who do not follow and know Jesus Christ truly, they do not understand their real problem. Church, how do we tell them? What is the model? From where do we receive our training to tell the masses of the world about the One who made the way? about the one who desires that none of them should perish, but that all of them should come to repentance? How do we tell them about the one who desires for them to know all about Him? You see, there are many different designs. There are many different methods which people have employed to share the gospel message throughout the generations. But the bottom line is how did Jesus teach us to approach people with the truth of the gospel? And to that answer, we find Jesus walking down this road and Him sharing with two men on the road to Emmaus, you've got to go back to the writings of Moses. You've got to go back to the, to the teachings of the prophets. You've got to go back and tell them why Jesus came and why they need Him in their lives. My friends, we've got to go back and we've got to show folks that they are sinners. We've got to go back. And we've got to remind folks of what it says in Romans chapter number 3, verse number 19. That Jesus, that, excuse me, that, that the Word of God, the New Testament, I'm excuse me, the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, I'll get it out in a second. The Ten Commandments are there to reveal our sinfulness and to show us our need for Jesus who went to the cross to take away our sin. Sin came into the world through Adam and Eve. It was birthed into the, into the spiritual DNA of man's makeup through Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God. They are nothing more than the evidence and the revelation that humankind is sinful. We do fall short of God's glory. And there's absolutely nothing we can do to fix it. Jesus Christ came 
for one purpose, to be the perfect Lamb of God. Jesus is God in human flesh. Jesus came to live the one and only perfect life. Jesus came to be the sacrifice, the Savior, the one who takes away our sin and gives us His righteousness. Friends out there, if you've never heard the gospel message, pick up God's Word. Let it speak to you. Understand that you are a sinner. There's nothing you can do about it. And Jesus is the only answer. He's the only hope. He's the only way. And today, that is why we celebrate His resurrection because in Him, we have received the victory of Jesus and His salvation. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, today, Lord, just take this simple message to the church and to the world that Jesus is risen, that He has prepared the way, that He alone has made a way to take away from us sin. He has made the way. Lord, the Bible is very filled with everything that shows us that we are sinners. Lord, the present world we live in shows us that we are sinners. Lord, the present world shows us that there's nothing we can do to fix the sin. Lord, if mankind could fix the sin, they would have fixed it long ago. But Father, from generation to generation to generation, there has been nothing but sin in the world. But Lord, You came that those who would believe You came because You desire that none of us suffer the penalty of our sin. You came so that You could take away our sin. You came. And Father, I pray that others will know that You came to bring them victory over the sin in their lives, to bring them victory over the penalty, over the punishment, over the guilt, over the shame. That Father, just like You showed Adam and Eve, that, that someone has, that something has to die to cover sin and you killed animals to cover up their nakedness when they realized they were naked. That Father Jesus Christ had to come. He had to go to the cross. He had to willingly give Himself as the Lamb of God to be the only sacrifice that could cover and take away our sin. And Jesus Christ was buried in the ground just as He's told us about the seed. And He rose from the dead alive again. And now He has given us His Holy Spirit. He has given the Holy Spirit to the church that we would go out and share this message. Lord, today, save souls. And Lord, remind the church. And Lord, restore us to the place that You have us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, if you have responded to this message this morning, in some way, I would encourage you to, to look me up, and maybe to, to go to Macedonia Baptist Church's website, www.mbcjefferson.org, and leave a note there, maybe in the prayer and praise section, or contact me, my information is there. But let us know that you have responded, or that you have questions, and we will respond back to you. I hope that everyone has a wonderful and blessed day. Macedonia Church family, I love each and every one of you, and we miss you. And know, too, that this too will pass, and we will once again be joined together and able to worship our Lord and Savior together. Goodbye.